All right. Okay, terrific. Uh, so again, thanks uh, to all for uh, attending this evening. Uh, thanks to Tom and Randy in the Middletown uh, Historical Society for uh, inviting me to speak tonight. I get a chance uh, to talk with you all about uh, something that uh, has been, you know, real fun and important and interesting to me uh, for the last 25 years, which is the American Revolution in Monmouth County and even within Monmouth County, uh, particularly along the Bay Shore, uh, which was the military frontier line. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the slide, uh, slides. So uh, for those of you who don't know uh, a little bit about me, I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, I look at the American Revolution but I, I don't focus on the quote unquote great men, I focus on ordinary people. And what I've done over the last 25 years is I put together a census of the revolutionary population of Monmouth County. Um, and I go searching for uh, really interesting uh, biographies, really interesting forgotten events. Um, and then I total, total things up. So I have a combination of uh, qualitative and quantitative, and I, again, looking at the regular uh, people who lived in a very irregular time. Um, and, and just to note, I've, I've written, as, as Tom notes, uh, quite a bit on the topic, have a couple of books on, on the revolution in Monmouth County, as well as a number of uh, journal articles. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, so let's talk about Monmouth County uh, as it looked on the eve of the, the start of the American Revolution. So first of all, Monmouth County, when we talk about revolutionary era Monmouth County, what were, was uh, the county of Monmouth and Ocean together. Uh, it was one of New Jersey's larger counties, the third largest in population, um, but it still had less than 15,000 people. So to put this in perspective, uh, you could grab all of the, the people who lived uh, uh, between Sandy Hook and Little Egg Harbor, all the way inland as far as Allentown. You could grab all those people together, bus them up to a New, New Jersey Devils hockey game, uh, and they wouldn't sell out the arena. And uh, that's important when we talk about the revolutionary era because by any modern standard, uh, New Jersey and Monmouth County were incredibly rural. Um, the entire, uh, the entire uh, state of New Jersey had about 150,000 people. So again, if you took the entire population of New Jersey, you, you could fill uh, MetLife Stadium uh, with the northern half of the state. You could fill, um, uh, Lincoln Financial Stadium with the southern half of the state, the entire state's population could fit in two football arenas today. Um, there were no cities in Monmouth County. There were a number of uh, smaller towns, uh, Middletown Point, present day Matawan, Middletown, Shrewsbury, Freehold, Toms River. These were towns. Uh, they had a, you know, they had a couple of stores, uh, but again, nothing that we would uh, associate with being a city. Uh, in the entire county of Monmouth, there was one library privately held. Um, there was one school uh, held uh, just outside of uh, Freehold. Um, Monmouth County had two principal economies, a maritime economy in the Bay Shore and, and along the bays uh, heading down the shore. Um, but the, this was, but a maritime existence was not the preferred existence. It was not a way to gather wealth. If you wanted to gather wealth, the route was agriculture. And particularly uh, Middletown Township uh, was excellent farmland. The, uh, and there were a number of prosperous farms uh, in Middletown. Monmouth County had six townships. Um, and they're obviously all a great deal larger than the townships in the county today. Middletown Township at the time stretched from
from Middletown Point or Matawan all the way to Sandy Hook. So it was the entire Bayshore was uh, Middletown Township. And when we talk about Middletown in uh, revolutionary era documents, very often you don't get a more precise uh, place name than Middletown. So uh, we have to do a fair amount of guessing uh, where exactly people are and where specific events are occurring um, within Middletown because it was a big place. Monmouth County was the scene of considerable civil war. And I picked that word very intentionally. The American Revolution absolutely was a war between Washington's Continental Army and the British Redcoats. But underneath that war between the professional armies, there was a great deal of civil war between Americans. Because the British held New York, Staten Island, and Sandy Hook throughout the war, uh, Anyone in Monmouth County, and particularly along the Bay Shore, who had uh, pro-British sympathies, uh, had access to shelter, had access to a commissary who would pay uh, for farmed goods, whether uh, raised on, on the farm of uh, the individual or whether stolen, um, and uh, had shelter in the event that uh, things got a little too hot at home. So Monmouth Countyans who harbored uh, British sympathies were uh, free through much of the war to act with impunity. So we had significant civil war. Uh, Staten, uh, excuse me, Sandy Hook was held by the British longer than any other piece of land in the 13 colonies. The British took it in April 1776 and didn't give it up until January 1784. Nowhere in the 13 colonies did the British hold land as long. Um, in the early months of the war, it was a confusing time period. There were, um, uh, there was a county militia, there were township militias underneath it, but it, the exact loyalties of these different militias are hard to discern. In Freehold Township, there were actually rival militias for a little while. Um, and the militias turned out, but exactly who they supported and at what times, hard to know. Um, and and the, the documentation suggests that at different times, militias behaved uh, differently and opportunistically. Um, there was after a period of time in which the most embittered loyalists were driven out of Monmouth County, uh, they ended up in Staten Island, they ended up uh, in Brooklyn, they ended up on Sandy Hook, and they conducted vindictive loyalist raids back into Monmouth County. There were also parts of Monmouth County uh, that were particularly uh, swamp areas and the pine lands that were held by loyalist uh, partisan gangs. Um, there was sustained illegal trade, sometimes called the London trade, which was uh, between the prosperous farms at, of uh, Monmouth County and the British commissary at Sandy Hook. And later in the war, there were vigilante Whig reprisals. Uh, and the group uh, most notably called themselves the Retaliators. I say Whig instead of Patriot, uh, the Whigs were uh, supporters of the revolution. And I call them Whigs rather than Patriots because that's what they called themselves. They called themselves Whigs. And in calling themselves Whigs, they were aligning with the party of political reform in England and their enemies they called Tories because the Tories were the party of the crown in England. Um, the scope of all of this civil war was quite significant. Um, I've documented that at least 20% of the men in Monmouth County suffered in some tangible way during the war, documented well over 100 battles and skirmishes, um, and more than 600 Monmouth Countyans uh, actually wore a red coat. They joined uh, the New Jersey Volunteers, who actually in the early months of the war wore green coats, but eventually wore red coats. 
but actually more than 600 Monmouth Countians joined the New Jersey Volunteers, which was an American Corps of the British Army. And hundreds more uh, served uh, the Loyalist cause in other ways. Let's talk now about Middletown specifically. In the fall of 1776, the leading military officer in Middletown Township is George Taylor. Um, if you know where Mar Marlpit Hall is, Marlpit Hall was the home of Edward Taylor. Edward was George's father. Uh, George Taylor was the colonel of the 1st Regiment of Monmouth Militia, and he had the unenviable job of cobbling together his sort of ragtag militia and, and some state troops and faced opposite Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook had, uh, uh, Sandy Hook had uh, several large British warships. It had hundreds of British soldiers at different times. And George Taylor had ballpark about 200 men, no artillery, uh, questionable uh, ability to hold the land if the British ever turned on him. George Taylor watched this. He penned desperate letters to uh, the New Jersey government requesting greater assistance. The assistance never uh, materialized. And George Taylor, uh, in the fall of 1776, quietly began a friendly correspondence with, the lo with loyalists. There was a loyalist group at Shark River and Long Branch headed by Samuel Wright. George Taylor was a quote unquote friend of that loyalist association. When, the, uh, when Washington's army was defeated uh, and chased by the British across New Jersey into Pennsylvania, George Taylor uh, stopped, uh, at, stopped as a active colonel of the New Jersey militia. He declared himself a neutral. Um, when Continentals under David Foreman of Freehold came after him, George Taylor uh, fled to Sandy Hook. And when the British uh, briefly controlled New Jersey before Washington's army came back across New Jersey after the Battle of Trenton, George Taylor was appointed a colonel of the new Loyalist militia of Monmouth County and came into the county to, be, to recruit for his new Loyalist militia. He would ultimately lead at least four raids into Monmouth County uh, during the war. Middletown was the military frontier line. The military frontier line is a term used by military historians uh, to essentially uh, note the place on which uh, one side holds the, the, the territory on one side, the other side holds the territory on the other. Middletown was that frontier line. The British held, the British held Raritan Bay. The British held Sandy Hook. Uh, the British had the ability to penetrate anywhere into Monmouth County, a uh, handful of miles, anywhere they wanted, anytime. Um, and of course, as you head farther inland to places like Colts Neck and Freehold, you now have areas that, that the Whigs can, can capably defend. But Middletown is neither of, of those. It's not British held, but it's not securely held by the Whigs either. Um, as a result, when the uh, Whigs attempted to hold Middletown, uh, the uh, 200 militiamen uh, camped at uh, Hartshorn's house in the Highlands. They were surprised by uh, British soldiers at what is commonly called the Battle of the Navasink, but uh, honestly, it was really more of a skirmish than a battle. In any event, 73 uh, Monmouth militiamen were captured that evening. Uh, 23 more were killed. It was the worst uh, single day for the Monmouth County militia of, of the war. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the leaving after George Taylor becomes a, uh, a, a, a member of the, the British side, Colonel David Foreman is now the county's senior most uh, Whig military officer. And he proposes a, a plan to Governor Livingston, a plan to George Washington, 
to fortify the highlands and basically take the, the region back. And both Livingston and Washington rebuff him and said, you can't hold that land. The men uh, in your men aren't even loyal. We can't spare the artillery. Um, and so this area stays no man's land. Uh, Middletown gets penetrated numerous times through the war. Um, Middletown Point is burned in May 1778. The British, of course, march through Middletown with ease immediately after the, the Battle of Monmouth. Um, Middletown is raided several times in 1779 by an African-American-led loyalist group called the Black Brigade. Um, and Middletown is again penetrated uh, by 1,500 raiders in June 1781. Um, in addition to the, to the Monmouthers who put on a red coat and joined the British Army, there are irregulars as well. The irregulars of the Black Brigade, largely comprised of runaway slaves who are sheltered by the British and turn to raiding as a form of sustaining themselves in their, uh, they, they set up a camp on Sandy Hook called Refugee Town and they raid into Middletown uh, significant, uh, significantly. There are also the associated loyalists uh, who are uh, loyalists who do not want to serve in the British Army because frankly, life in the British Army is difficult. And these are, these are people who uh, would rather uh, ply their trade as raiders and sometimes as fishermen and sometimes whatever else to make a living. But the associate the associated loyalists would ultimately uh, gain infamy when they were to hang uh, Captain Joshua Huddy of Colts Neck, and they hang him on the Highlands, and it starts a uh, a, a series of reprisals at or at the end of the war that briefly threatened the, the Paris peace talks. Um, and then there are the London traders and the Raritan Cowboys. And these are shadowy groups that uh, basically trade with the British on Staten Island and Sandy Hook. Um, in the case of the Raritan Cowboys, they are more or less led by a man named William Clark, who is from Woodbridge. Um, and the Raritan Cowboys were called cowboys because they stole cows. And they stole cows from the Middletown farms. They put them on barges. They got them to Sandy Hook. Uh, the London traders were uh, sort of a shadowy network of people who found, uh, who were willing middlemen uh, to farmers in, in Middletown uh, who are happy to sell to the commissary at Sandy Hook for money. Okay, so now we've talked about Middletown as a bit of a mess. Um, let's uh, talk about the new leaders. First, the revolution. Um, opened up uh, the leadership ranks uh, to new people. And we have a lot of the old families sort of retiring themselves from leadership. Uh, the Carney family, the Grovers and Taylors were leading families before the war. They largely disappear from the leadership ranks um, and they're replaced by uh, new, new leading families, Smock, Shanks, Walls, Wallings, Hendricksons. Um, uh, in Middletown Point, the Burroughs family. These uh, families are not poor, but in some cases they're not particularly rich either. In fact, one third of the revolutionary leaders of Middletown were modest landowners who probably didn't even meet the suffrage requirements to vote before the war. Um, and about half of these new leaders would suffer in some tangible way during the war. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about militia officers. Um, I see that there are some questions coming through and uh, uh, Tom, as long as you don't mind, I'll just uh, keep going and take questions at the end. Sure, it's what we usually do. Okay, super. So let's talk about how this world looked to the new military leaders of Middletown. Well, we know how the, the world looked because they, they uh, penned a petition to the New Jersey legislature in March, 1777, just after uh, the loyalist um, 
the loyalist rebellion uh, was was crushed. And now they had the problem of reestablishing Whig rule at a time when the people around them, so many of the people around them, their loyalty was unknown or they couldn't be trusted. And so uh, I'll just read to you part of the, the petition. Those lenient measures exercised to the most notorious offenders only hardened them and their adherence uh, it, to their crimes. As our affairs now stand, the disaffection is so general and great that even amongst the guards assembled, there are some that have declared they would not fire an alarm gun should they be on duty and see the enemy approach. We are fully convinced that unless some spirited measures are taken, we, meaning the officers of the newly constituted militia, we will fall prey to the enemy within our bounds. We're gonna test this hypothesis in a few slides. Okay, so let's talk now about the, the, middle, the militia leaders of Middletown. First, uh, Middletown comprised uh, half of the 1st Regiment of Monmouth Militia. The other half came out of Freehold Township. Um, so that was a total of five militia companies, uh, which meant you had five captains, a major, a lieutenant colonel, and a colonel. Um, and I focused on the senior officers uh, for this presentation. Let's look at uh, the lives of two of these men during the war. Ensign John Whitlock of Middletown was the younger brother of Major James Whitlock. They both served uh, at the disaster in the Navasink Islands, uh, the so-called Battle of the Navasink. They were both captured. James, the older brother, died in prison. John remained a POW into 1778. He's released in August 1778 after being held in prison uh, for 18 months. Um, he rejoins the militia in 1779. By the way, in doing so, he breaks the terms of his release where he had to sign the document saying he wouldn't take up arms again. Um, he is rewarded for returning to the militia by being promoted to major uh, his, his older brother's old commission. That's not a coincidence. It was done, I'm sure it was, everyone uh, knew the important symbolism of putting uh, John in James's former uh, commission. Um, but he's captured again in 1780 and uh, not released again until the latter part of 1781. Um, the continental government, recognizing that he spent much of the war in jail uh, it, it, as a POW, decides to assume his debts because while in jail, he's accruing debts on his uh, farm. He's also accruing debts during periods where he's paroled to private homes uh, in, in New York City and he has to pay rent. Uh, the New Jersey government also grants him his brother's estate because uh, when James died, there was no will. And so the New Jersey government actually uh, passes an act through the legislature to transfer title uh, to John. So uh, John lives, the war is hard on John. He's captured twice. He has two uh, long time periods as a POW, but he actually comes out of the war wealthier than he went into the war. Uh, another example is Captain Hendrick Smock. Uh, the Smock family is a leading family uh, in, in the local revolution. One of his brothers is John, the lieutenant colonel of the Middletown militia. Um, and another one is Barn Smock, who's captain of the artillery company. Uh, Hendrick is plundered during the Loyalist insurrection uh, during December 1776. And then he's plundered again when the British army comes through Middletown after the Battle of Monmouth. He serves as a captain in the militia. And while a captain in the militia, he also serves as a delegate in the New Jersey Assembly. He's then captured in 1780 by the Black Brigade under Colonel Ty. 
and he's uh, paroled home on the condition that he presents the grievances of loyalists who, who are in New York and have grievances about the bad treatment they've received from the Whigs. He retires from military service, but continues to hold civil offices. So how typical were these two people I profiled? Well, let's look. Here are 11, the 11 other senior uh, militia officers for Middletown Township during the war. There are uh, uh, a total, because some of these men are coming in and out of different positions, there are a total of 13. Of the 13, and hold on, I'm gonna just grab my, my stats here. Of the 13, one dies, seven are captured during the war, uh, two are captured twice, five are plundered or have, or have their home destroyed, one twice. Um, only two of these men, John Stilwell and Thomas Walling, have no documented significant action uh, against them. And po it's possible if the documentation were better, we could find stuff on them too. But based on uh, what is available in the doc documentary trail, 11 of the 13 senior uh, militia officers from Middletown suffered in, a, in a, some very tangible way during the war. So uh, people always ask me, well, why did the Continental Army help? Where's the Continental Army? So let's talk about the Continental Army. First, it's important to remember that the founders of the, of the United States are creating a country based on the experience they've had with the British. And they loathe the British Army. They loathe that the British Army quartered in their homes. Uh, they loathe that the British Army competed uh, for labor on the docks. Um, so they didn't want a army mixing in with the general population. In fact, men, the, the term that was often used about standing armies was they were engines of tyranny. So uh, the the long-term stationing of troops in Middletown or any other distressed locality was not something the locals necessarily wanted. Um, but because Middletown was the seat of so much action, the Continentals came in a number of times for different reasons. Um, so the uh, in November of 1776, Pennsylvania and uh, David Foreman's uh, Continental Regiment came into the county and arrested a number of loyalists. Um, they also kind of foolishly attacked the British uh, outpost on Sandy Hook and were driven off uh, quickly. Um, then uh, during George Taylor's led loyalist insurrection, uh, it was a regiment of Pennsylvania Continentals under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Gurney and supported by a regiment of Delaware Continentals who actually came in and toppled the Loyalist regime. So in this way, it took about two weeks for the Continentals to do it. Um, in this particular case, the Continentals were highly effective because it, it's not clear that the local Whigs were well enough armed and well enough organized to do it on their own. It, it, so uh, in that case, the Continentals played a pivotal role in the local war in Monmouth County. After the Battle of Monmouth, when the British are retreating uh, through Middletown to Sandy Hook, they, they are shadowed by uh, the Continentals under Captain Daniel Morgan. And Daniel Morgan captures a number of stragglers and deserters from the British Army. And the fact that Morgan's men were there probably limited the plundering of the British during this time period. And then in late 1778, uh, Captain John Burroughs, who is in the New Jersey uh, Continental Line uh, up around Morristown, gets paroled home for a month. During that time, he brings some of his men with him. He launches a raid on the British at Sandy Hook, captures a couple of boats, 
Um, Major Richard Howell, uh, also with a small detachment, about 30 men, uh, goes and captures a number of London traders, uh, has a campaign against the so-called pine robbers. Um, and the, and all, every time there are always British deserters sort of drifting through the countryside, getting picked up by these Continentals. So uh, the Continentals do play a role, uh, a supporting role in, in the local war. And uh, in this case, though, all of these detachments are relatively small and they're all short, short term. None of these uh, individuals, these continental units, stay in Middletown for more than a couple weeks. Uh, but that will change. And we'll talk about what the continentals, when they uh, transition to a longer term uh, encampment. So um, because this is the military frontier, uh, Governor Livingston uh, asks George Washington for more protection for the area. Uh, he calls the Monmouth shoreline the theater of spoil and destruction and uh, petitions for help. Washington sort of sits on the request for a while and then writes back. And, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, Washington, in my mind, was an absolutely fantastic leader uh, because he, he, he was just pragmatic and sensible and respectful and just the man you need to hold together an organization that really lacked um, the means to uh, overwhelm its enemy. So here's Washington's response to Livingston. A few hundred continental troops quiet the minds and give satisfaction to the people of the country. But considered in the true light, they do rather more harm than good. They draw the attention of the enemy and being not able to resist them, are obliged to fly and leave the country at the mercy of the foe. But, as I said before, the people do not view things in the same light, and therefore they must be indulged. So Washington thinks that sending troops into Middletown is a fool's errand. But, because he, his job is as much political as military, and he knows he has to hold the New Jersey countryside together because the New Jersey countryside is what feeds his army. Um, he decides that he's going to send men into Middletown, but he drags his feet in doing so. And the and, uh, long-term encampment of Continentals in Middletown does not begin until December of 1778. And when it begins, it begins with a, a regiment of Pennsylvanians under Caleb North. Um, North has initially uh, some success during the, his time in Middletown. Uh, he he uh, turns around a raiding party. He captures a British vessel, a small British vessel. But then it goes south pretty quick. Um, Essex Hartshorn uh, notes that the Continentals uh, broke into his cellar. Um, North's officers talk about spending time with two very uh, agreeable ladies at a sociable um, while, while they're supposed to be patrolling. Um, and then on April 3rd, it really falls apart. Uh, or a company of his men mutiny at Middletown and the local Monmouth militia has to go and put down the mutiny of Continentals. Um, uh, on April 5th, just two days later, uh, there's a loyalist raid and the Continentals missed their, the main object of the raid, meaning either intentionally or by bad luck, the Continentals did not intercept the loyalist raiding party. Um, there's another robbery committed on April uh, 13th. On the 15th, uh, North's men leave and they're replaced by a Virginia regiment under Benjamin Ford. We'll talk about Ford's men now. Um, so Ford has been in Monmouth County only a week and the news to, gets to Washington that it's not going well. And Washington writes to Livingston, I mean to withdraw the Monmouth detachment. An alarming spirit of mutiny and desertion has shown itself on several occasions. 
there is no saying how far the infection might spread. What I imagine is going on is that these continentals are mixing with disaffected locals who are um, making a lot of money on the London trade. And the continentals are poor and they are looking at the profit potential of doing business with the, with the British and mixing with people who are not at all appreciative of them being there. Uh, so uh, Livingston, however, requests more time before Washington pulls Ford's men out. And so Ford's men remain. Um, and while this happens again, uh, Ford's men are perhaps less vigilant than they should be. Uh, one of Ford's captains, a man named Thomas Bell, uh, uh, talks about having a, a great time uh, with the fine ladies in the neighborhood of Tinton Falls. And then, it, and then the bad news really happens. On April 25th, 700 raiders, British and loyalists both, land uh, at Middletown and they march against Ford. Ford retreats to Colts Neck without firing a shot of resistance. The local militia and uh, 15 New Jersey Continentals do what they can to offer resistance. They fire some popping shots along the way. The loyalists capture 20 to 30 prisoners. They burn a mill and three houses. They capture 22 Continentals who get stranded uh, behind at Tinton Falls. Um, and the New Jersey uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Robert Morris, in the understatement of all time, notes Colonel Ford is censured by some of the inhabitants for his conduct. Um, Ford, Ford returns, but only stays until June 1, and then ret retreats on June 1. The, Brit the British and loyalists learn of the retreat, and they sack Tinton Falls on June 10th. Um, Important to note that Middletown's leaders did fight back with the means that they had available to them. Uh, starting in uh, June 1779, they began to muster into state troops. State troops are militia units that unlike normal militia, which take one month on, one month off, the state troops stay uh, turned out continuously and draw pay from the state for doing so. So that was one thing that helped uh, improve the performance of the militia was being turned into state troops. And we know that their performance improved considerably because in June of 1781, when 1,500 British and loyalists come into Middletown uh, in a, an event called the Battle of the 1500, um, again, not really a battle in any formal sense of the word, but the state troops, uh, probably about 300 of them, backed up by another few hundred militia, uh, successfully skirmish with the raiders the entire day, harry them throughout, and the raiders are not able to gather much plunder because every time they break into small parties, they get, they get harassed and uh, sniped at. By the, by the militia and the state troops. Same thing happens again when a, there's a raid of Pleasant Valley in uh, January 1782. The, the discipline for enforcing the militia to turn out get better and better. Um, uh, by this time, uh, Colonel Asher Holmes of Freehold is the commander of the 1st Regiment of the militia. He's a very competent commander. Uh, the turnout gets better. They construct an, a network of beacons so that they, so that when the raiders land along the bay shore, the beacons get uh, alert people all the way into freehold uh, almost immediately, and so the freeholders are able to come out and support the middle towners uh, much more effectively. The uh, the middle towners also fought back with a number of irregular activities outside of uniform uh, on, on the, it, on the, with the whale boats, 
uh, these small ore powered vessels that they row against larger British vessels at night. Um, they capture a number of smaller vessels. Uh, privateering on the Raritan Bay under John Schenk, who's a captain. Uh, they penetrate as far as Brooklyn, cap carry off prominent uh, loyalists and, and British as prisoners. Um, Adam Heiler, who is a privateer captain from New Brunswick, but his crew is largely pulled from the Bay Shore, uh, raids Staten Island a couple times. And then we have the outright vigilante violence of the Association for Retaliation, the retaliators. For people who were suspected of being London traders, disaffected loyalists, um, there was brutal eye for an eye vigilante violence going on outside of the courts. Um, and we can talk we can we can talk about whether that's good or bad, um, but it sure happened and uh, you know dozens of loyalists or suspected loyalists were punished brutally in the later years of the war. Um, the Association for Retaliation in, uh, basically falls apart in 1783, and it gets replaced by another organization called the Association to Oppose the Return of Tories. Um, importantly, this association does conduct itself uh, according to the rule of law. Okay, so uh, concluding thoughts then. Middletown was part of a military frontier that stretched all the way around New York. Uh, so it went up through uh, Elizabeth, up through Bergen County, uh, through Westchester County in New York, and down through uh, Queens and uh, Nassau County in Long Island. But Middletown was an exceptional place because of the sheer quantity of activity and how long that activity lasted. Um, Middle, anyone who wants to understand the American Revolution as a civil war uh, really only need uh, to understand the experience of Middletown and places like it. So uh, with that, um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Um, it looks like there are a bunch waiting for me. Uh, so again, uh, a little bit on my books. I have a website and uh, with that, uh, let's get to the questions. All right, thank you, Mike. That was great. We do have a lot of questions, so let me uh, can read some to you. Okay, yeah. Would Would you mind? Uh, actually, it might be easier that way. Sure. Uh, we have one here. Uh, the Black Brigade. Somebody wants to know: Did that include Colonel Ty, and was he responsible for the assassination of Joseph Murray? Uh, Colonel Ty was not responsible for the assassination of Joseph Murray. Uh, that was uh, the the. The death of Murray uh, while, while tending his crops, um, gosh, we, we, know, we have pretty good documentation on that, but these were um, other refugees, uh, and I don't believe that the Black Brigade was involved in Murray's uh, death. Okay. Aside from Obadiah Stilwell and Joseph Murray, are you aware of any other skirmishes, skirmish-related casualties of people from Middletown? Oh, there were a bunch. Um, it would be hard. Uh, yeah, we. I could just start start throwing out names, but uh, two um, Middletowners were killed at the uh, when when Middletown Point was raided. Uh, I know one man's name, uh, Van Brackle, was one man's name. Huff was another. Um, there were in the Black Brigade raids of 1779-1780. There were there were deaths. Um, there, there were certainly a number of deaths. Um, if there's a better way for me to sort of total all that stuff up and get you information, we'll, we'll talk about that offline. Okay. How are the captured mili militia people treated by the British? Uh, good question. So um, throughout the war, there was a lot of um, confusion around how irregulars were should be treated and whether they deserved prisoner of war status. So 
if you capture the Continental officer, that was a prisoner of war. If you captured a British officer, that's a prisoner of war. If you capture the militia officer, it's not clear if you uh, capture the prisoner of war. And so at times the British were more lenient and at times they were less lenient. Um, there were a number of Monmouthers who, because of rel uh, perhaps good behavior or because they had kin in New York who went to bat for them, were taken off of the prison ships. Um, and let's face it, if you were on the prison ships for a long time, it was practically a death sentence. And they were taken off the prison ships and they were paroled to private homes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Hendrik Smock is one, one such example of that. Um, now, while in the private homes, they were still confined behind enemy lines, but obviously that's a much better existence than uh, being on the prison ships. Have you heard of any town presidents or soldiers uh, being involved with the Culper Spiron? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't know a lot about that. Okay. Uh, did the Continentals actually set up camp in Middletown? Yes. Uh, so Continentals were in Middletown many times. But again, let's be careful about our definition of Middletown. Um, Middletown is anything between Matawan and Sandy Hook. Um, if we're talking about the village of Middletown, uh, it's, it's hard to know for sure. It's highly likely that, uh, that because you had to be somewhere where your officers could be quartered because officers tended not to sleep in tents. Officers, when possible, were quartered in, in good homes. So they needed to be somewhere where there were good homes to quarter them. So it's almost certain that uh, Continentals were stationed in the village of Middletown, but the, the, the documentation is not so precise as to allow me to say, yes, Caleb North personally stayed at such and such a house. Okay. Uh, do you know specifically where the Pleasant Valley raid happened? Um, again, uh, frustrating here, but the documentation is not sufficient uh, to be able to say that the, during the raid of Pleasant Valley, uh, such and such uh, penetrated as far as this farmstead, and we have a good map uh, or a deed of the farm, which allows us to say where exactly that they made it to. Uh, we do know that there was a raid of Pleasant Valley in January 1782, um, and we know that it was during a, a period of time where there was enough snow on the ground so that the raiders actually came in, came on sleds uh, to carry their booty. Um, but again, it was not a particularly successful raid. Was Colonel Samuel Breeze from Middletown? Uh, Colonel Samuel Breeze was from Shrewsbury Township. Um, and Breeze is an interesting character. He was the first colonel of the Shrewsbury Township Militia, um, but he couldn't get anyone to turn out. And so he, he resigns in frustration and he weathers the war as something of a neutral, um, but someone who the Whigs looked on with a great deal of suspicion, but yet he still had, had friends and conducted business with leading Whigs. He, he's an interesting character. Could you expand a little bit more on the Black Brigades possibly? Were they made up of escaped slaves or emancipated slaves or who was in that? Yeah, uh, so, uh, and not, not to do too shameless a plug, but I have a chapter on the Black Brigade in my book, uh, The American Revolution of Monmouth County. But uh, real quickly on the Black Brigade, uh, there were a lot of African-Americans in, in this region, uh, about 10% of the population, about half were slave, about half were free. And <coughs> it, it was a tough time. Uh, there, were, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of suspicion about, uh, black, toward black people during this period of time. There was actually a curfew on uh, put in the townships of Middletown and Shrewsbury so that black people weren't allowed out at night regardless of their politics or anything else. 
uh, and they had, and then they had their uh, guns confiscated. So there was whatever resentment may have existed was compounded by these other actions taken by the local Whigs, and the British offered that any uh, black man who came behind British lines and served the crown was free. So the British offered to emancipate anyone who would serve the British cause. Um, but then when a, a lot of uh, African-Americans got behind British lines, life was terrible. They were, they were pressed onto British ships, which is a, what was a miserable life for, for a lot of these men. And uh, they, or they were, were, were basically turned into uh, uh, hoarders and, and ditch diggers. And so a lot only stayed in the British service for a short amount of time. And they end, and, and a you know, couple hundred ended up confederating in this organization called the Black Brigade, which was not a formal, there was no formal commission, there was no uniforms. But these were people who during the warm months hung out at Sandy Hook and raided into the American uh, countryside. Um, very, very successfully in 1779, 1780. Do you know of any, any examples of uh, local family members that were on opposite sides during the war? Oh, there, there were several. Um, the one that comes to mind immediately is uh, David Foreman, uh, who was a, a colonel in the Continental Army and briefly in uh, briefly until he got into trouble with the New Jersey government, was a general in the New Jersey militia and was Monmouth County's senior most uh, military figure through the first half of the war. He had a brother, uh, Ezekiel Foreman, who uh, was loyalist. And uh, Ezekiel uh, spent the first half of the war um, in trouble in, in interior New Jersey and was jailed in Philadelphia and eventually uh, is allowed to go to New York and live the rest of his life uh, as, as a loyalist behind British lines. But there are, there are, there are a number of stories like that. Um, that's just one because it's such a particularly prominent family. Did many residents of Middletown uh, switch sides during the war? Um, the answer to that is yes, with an important caveat, that switching sides implies that you were firmly on one side to begin with. Um, the, 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 the people of the period had a great term for what a lot of people on the, the, the military frontier were. They were trimmers. Uh, that was the word that was used. In other words, that you, you would trim your sails and blow with the wind, depending on who was in charge at the moment. Who was, uh, and so you had a lot of trimmers. And in fact, at the Battle of the Navasink, or uh, again, we'll call it battle because that's what it's called. Um, when the British uh, ambushed the militia, one of the things that the British found, and it, it, it angered the British so much that it actually makes it into uh, General Howe, the Supreme British Commander in America, writes back to his to Parliament about this, that the, the 73 militiamen who were captured in arms against the British, many of the men had protection papers on them, meaning that just a month earlier, when the, the loyalists were controlling the county, they accepted British protection. They basically signed a loyalty oath to the British. And while serving in the militia, they carried the British protection papers, probably because they knew that there was a chance they were gonna get captured and they wanted to be able to show the British that they had this sort of loyalty uh, to the British. So what do you call these people? They, they're, they switched sides, but maybe they were never really on one side or the other very much to begin with. Hmm. We'll have time for just a couple more questions. Um, is there actual documentation on the Association for Retaliation? Oh yeah. Uh, in fact, again, uh, an I wrote an entire book chapter uh, on the Association for Retaliation. 
Um, again, my, uh, the American Revolution on Monmouth County has an entire book chapter on it. And the articles of association for retaliation have been reprinted in a number of uh, books on Monmouth County. Um, you can find it in, for example, Franklin Ellis's History of Monmouth County has the entire um, articles that created the organization printed. So you don't, you don't even have to find the original document at the New Jersey archives. It's, it's been printed in a number of secondary sources. Okay, good to know. How were uh, loyalists treated after, after all the war? Yeah, so we know that uh, John Burroughs of Middletown Point uh, uh, founds at the end of the war the Association to Oppose the Return of Tories. This issue of whether the loyalists could come back was, a, was on everyone's mind. Um, there's a great petition that comes out of Monmouth County talking about uh, returning uh, loyalists, and I, I love the phrase, calls them atrocious monsters of wickedness. Um, just, I just love the, the florid text of the period. Um, so what we know is a handful of loyalists did in fact come home and settle peacefully. I suspect that these were loyalists who did not have blood on their hands. So uh, for example, there's a, um, uh, some members of the Von Mater family of Freehold in Middletown uh, who did not participate in the war, did return after the war, and as best I can tell, seemed to have settled in peacefully. But there are also a lot of individual scores to settle, a lot of individual cases of vigilantism um, that occurred well into the post-war period. All right, Mike. Uh, lastly, uh, besides your books, which I recommend everybody purchase, uh, are there any other books about the revolution in Middletown, Monmouth County you would recommend? Oh, well, it's a PhD dissertation as opposed to a book, but uh, David Fowler's uh, PhD dissertation called Egregious Villains is uh, to this day the best thing anyone's written about um, the pine robber phenomenon and these rural parts of New Jersey that were never really held by the Whigs. Um, and uh, I, I'd certainly recommend that for anyone um, who's looking uh, at, yeah, it's a scholarly piece, um, but I'd certainly re uh, recommend that. And then for the kind of um, not specific to Middletown, though there will be Middletown information in it, but for the best book on the differing levels of contact that goes on between Americans and British across the military frontier, uh, Judith Mann Buzzkirk's Generous Enemies is, is a very good book. Okay, great. We'll check into those. All right, Mike, uh, once again, thank you. It was an excellent presentation. So happy to have you with us. And uh, I'd just like to add, uh, thank you for everybody for joining us tonight. Anybody who wants additional info on the Middletown Township Historical Society, please visit us at middletownnjhistory.org. We hope to see you again. And uh, please check out uh, Michael's website and his books. We hope to see you again next month, every, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone.